We've come to the last video in the series on salvation modeling, and it's the one where we explore the idea of hybrid models incorporating some explicit and some implicit solvent techniques in order to maximize value for efficiency. So I have here a, a stolen quote, I guess, from Charles Dickens. Uh, one might refer to this as the best of models or the worst of models, depending on uh, which components are brought in. Let's just look at what uh, considerations may need to be accounted for. So let's start with uh, kinds of equilibria that one is interested in computing. And in particular, pKa. There is a very important chemical property. And the pKa is often computed from the Born-Haber cycle. So the Born-Haber cycle says that if I make a free energy cycle with a gas phase leg and an aqueous leg, and I have connecting the legs of my cycle, the free energies of salvation, then uh, the number I want, of course, to compute a pKa is this free energy change, the free energy of ionization. The pKa is related to that free energy change, is negative log exponent of this, so I simply uh, take that logarithm of an exponential, and the pKa is the delta G divided by 2.303 times the universal gas constant times the temperature. So, from the standpoint of doing a continuum calculation, I should be able to do a killer sledgehammer calculation in the gas phase of taking a proton off my molecule. Really nail this free energy change. And then I need to compute the free energy of salvation of uh, the, the conjugate acid and of the conjugate base. And there's the salvation free energy of a proton. Well, how would you do these calculations? Okay, a few considerations if you're going to uh, hop on the pKa computing bandwagon. Step one, I have an anion here. I am going to need diffuse functions in my basis set and a good level of theory, of course, in order to get an accurate gas phase deprotonation free energy. So anytime you see anions, naturally you're thinking diffuse functions, big basis set. How do you compute the electronic energy of a proton? So if you ask Gaussian 09 to do that for you, or any other electronic structure program for that matter, it won't because a proton doesn't have any electrons. So there is no electronic energy for a proton. But you can just plug in the mass of the proton to get its translational free energy into a good spreadsheet. You can come up with a G for the proton. The free energy of salvation of a proton, if you can't compute its electronic energy, you certainly can't compute its uh, continuum solvent energy easily. But uh, you can actually take the experimental value. It's uh, really pretty well nailed down at this point with some, uh, some uncertainty, obviously, but uh, the current value is minus 264 kcals per mole within a certain definition of standard state concentrations in the gas phase and in solution. And that's just noted here. We have to keep track of our standard states. The item in red here is the concern, of course, every time you make an error of 1.4 kcals per mole. So that's not that big an error, right? Chemical accuracy, which takes sledgehammer theory in the gas phase to achieve, you're hoping to get to 1. 1.4 is an entire log unit worth of error. And so that's a bit disturbing because the errors in ionic salvation free energies, that would be this leg here, I showed you some errors in a prior uh, lecture where 3 to 6 kcals per mole was not that unusual. So that would be 2 to 4 pK units. It's a little dissatisfying to uh, be able to measure something experimentally to say hundredths of a pH unit and then you make a, a prediction that's off by 4 or, or even larger in, in worst case scenarios. Now, you can hope that you have some systematic errors and make corrections based on functional groups, and that was published some time ago now. But in any case, that's, that's sort of the protocol that one might employ. So in the absence of explicit uh, salvation of any sort, I'm just going to take that same Born-Haber cycle and just write it out explicitly that if I want this delta G, which is equal to 2.303 RT times the pKa, then I have this relationship where I'm going to take computed value, computed value, experimental value, computed value. So this just shows you what you would do if you were really filling in a spreadsheet. But let's consider another possibility. What if I cluster my ion in the gas phase? So I'm going to consider 
conjugate acid plus a water molecule going to an explicitly microsolvated anion, microsolvated by one water and a proton. And that means on the lower leg, of course, I have to have the same chemistry, but what's the delta G here? Well, uh, the argument is, of course, that the delta G on this leg doesn't change at all because on the prior slide, just writing A minus aqueous, that implies this is a solution species. It is surrounded by water molecules. So the fact that you materialized one of those water molecules specifically out of the continuum, it shouldn't have any effect whatsoever. I mean, certainly the cluster has a different solvation free energy, but for purposes of thinking about taking an aqueous conjugate acid and some aqueous water and making aqueous A- minus and aqueous protons, this is exactly the same process. It's just that instead of writing AQ, we took one of the H2Os out of AQ and put it over here. All right, so again, if I follow the free energy cycle, then here's the pKa I want. I have an extra step here, the free energy of salvation of water. That's the vapor pressure of water expressed in free energy units. Uh, I have presumably an easier to compute ionic salvation free energy. Why easier? Because this is bigger. So by being bigger, it's going to be a smaller value. I may make smaller errors. Of course, I'm going to have to hope that I don't introduce error by not doing a good job of computing this explicit gas phase complexation energy. But nevertheless, there's hope that that'll be uh, useful. Uh, and so you can actually study these water clusters in order to get at, I told you there's an experimental free energy of salvation for the proton. It, you might wonder how you go about uh, excuse me, measuring that. So it's not entirely trivial, but uh, there are ways to evaluate various mass spectral data, and uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing, you can go look up this paper. It does turn out that when you set the free energy of salvation of the proton, that's equivalent to setting the absolute potential of the normal hydrogen electrode. And You might remember from your electrochemistry that electrode potentials are always relative, and that's because there is no absolute potential, but you can get an absolute potential once you have an absolute proton salvation free energy. Okay, well, after that digression, let's just compare these two approaches for computing the pKa of methanol as an acid. And so the pKa of methanol is known, it's 15.5. And so if I use the first cycle I showed, that's the one that has no explicit water, so it's just going to be methanol going to methoxide plus proton, and we'll take the gas phase change plus the proper sum and difference of salvation free energies. So here's the gas phase cost, it's 375 kcals per mole in free energy to rip that proton off. Here is the free energy of salvation of the proton, and the different, I told you it was 264 on a different slide, and that is because the standard state change of going from one atmosphere to one molar was in that number, it's not in this number, so that's that 1.9 kcals is the difference. And then finally the free energy of salvation of methanol, minus 5.11. Add those all together, and you get, uh, with the methoxide computed free energy of salvation, you get a pKa of 20.4. So these are all experimental data, right? I mean, those are actually known. This is the only variable, but apparently it's, it's in significant error because we get a pKa of 20.4 instead of 15.5. So we're off by 5 pK units. Now, what if instead we do the next cycle? where there's one water molecule in the gas phase, it clusters the methoxide, and will end up the only unknown, that, that's actually been done in the gas phase, the clustering energy is known, so the delta G in the gas phase is 358, here's the same proton, the same methanol, we do need the vapor pressure of water expressed as a free energy of salvation, and now a new salvation free energy for the clustered methoxide and the predicted pKa from that equation is within a half a pKa unit, so substantial improvement in the prediction by virtue of clustering. Now we can explore uh, if, you know, if one water is good, maybe more than one water is better, yes? And so let's take a system where multiple waters might be expected to matter, and that is carbonic acid. So carbonic acid has two pKa's, one to make the bicarbonate ion, one to make the carbonate dianion. So the first pKa is 6.4, the second pKa is 
So we can uh, do the computation various ways. I've color-coded some waters in here, a red water, a green water, a blue water. And of course, we can do it with no waters at all. So that's the cycle with no explicit solvation. And what you predict is the first pKa is minus 0.6, so that's pretty bad, 7 pKa unit error. And the next pKa is 1.6, so that's uh, one seriously acidic acid with that protocol. So you're off by almost 9 pKa units. When we introduce the first water of solvation, there is an improvement in both pKa's, but they're still quite far from experiment. If you bring in a second water of solvation, there's continued improvement, and by the time you allow three waters of salvation, we're up to a uh, two pK unit error and a little bit more than one pK unit error. So another example of improving the accuracy with clustering. Let's look at a, a group of molecules. So this is, uh, from this paper, a series of acids with calculated pKa compared to experimental pKa. And the black dots are no explicit solvent, so just the pure continuum com computation. And now what I've done is I've taken, I I've used a certain protocol to decide when it might be appropriate to include one explicit water of salvation. And that protocol involves looking at how much charge there is built up on the conjugate base on a single atom. And if we used uh, clustering, then I've turned the circle from black to white, and I have introduced instead the clustered approach pKa prediction. So for this case, for example, this is where the pKa was predicted when it was unclustered. This is where the pKa is predicted when it's clustered. So you'll, you'll see open circles associated with uh, blue circles in vertical progression. And so this one got better, and this one got better, and this one got better, and this one got better. And in fact, if we use a sort of a poor man's animation here, and you look at where the white circles are relative to the blue and the black, you'll see that every single case benefited from clustering. They all got closer to the ideal line. And so that suggests that clustering can be a very powerful tool. Now, with that in mind, you might say, well, what about two waters clustering instead of one? What about three? And so, uh, you know, assessment of that has, has been undertaken. And in general, the additional gain is often offset by the problem that as you introduce more explicit solvent, you introduce a need to start sampling phase space. That is, there are now so many different minima that may contribute to an equilibrium population that to get your free energy, you've got to sample over all those minima. That was the beauty of the continuum model. By erasing the solvent, you didn't have to do sampling. It was just a single calculation. And so as a rule, it's a little bit of a judgment call and a little bit of a hit or miss game. Uh, how many explicit solvents should you include and it takes sort of experience and intuition. It's nice to be able to demonstrate you've converged properties with respect to how many you choose, but as I say, it's a bit of a judgment call. And just to sort of illustrate that, here is a continuum solvent model being used to compute a catalytic cycle for a water splitting catalyst. And so what does a water splitting catalyst do? It takes a water molecule and it turns it into oxygen. Of course, it doesn't do one water molecule. It takes at least two water molecules to make a molecule of oxygen. But it is a means to generate molecular oxygen from water. And uh, how does that happen? Well, you need to do oxidation. And so what's being shown here are the potentials associated, or the pKa's, potentials associated with oxidation. So loss of electrons is an oxidation. And these are potentials against the normal hydrogen electrode. PKAs associated with losing protons. These are so-called proton-coupled electron transfer steps expressed in voltage units. It's not important to understand this whole uh, thermochemical cycle. I'll just point out to you that there's this critical step along the way where a ruthenium oxo, you've got to make an OO bond, and the way the OO bond is made is that water, as a nucleophile, attacks with its oxygen the oxygen atom of the oxo that has an activation free energy of 20.7 kcals per mole 
and in the process you end up making a hydroperoxo which goes on to do some more oxidation, ultimately lose oxygen and start the catalytic cycle over again as another water coordinates. So why did I pick this particular example? Well it turns out if you use a continuum solvent model and you just have this ruthenium species, so this is the molecule, it's actually in the 5 state when it gets attacked, but I'm in the drawing here it was labeled as ruthenium 4, which is this molecule. If you bring a water up and try to nucleophilically attack this oxygen with continuum around everything else, it's repulsive at all distances. You cannot even find this species. Of course, the species differs by a proton, which begins to give you a clue why you, not, why you might not be able to find it. So in order to successfully find a transition state structure for nucleophilic attack, you need to include four water molecules. So here's one. This is the one that's actually doing the nucleophilic attack and making a new OO bond. So this is ruthenium, this is the oxo, here's the ligand. As it's attacking, it is transferring a proton to this explicit solvent water. It turns out that if you only use two water molecules, that's not good enough. This water won't accept that proton, this is still repulsive, you can't find the transition state structure. You need to stabilize this incipient hydronium ion by allowing it to hydrogen bond to two additional water molecules. So by the time you've included these four, now you can actually find a relevant transition state structure. You do, of course, have to look at different structures. There's some sampling that goes on here. This is only one of the possible structures. Uh, and that allows you to understand this critical chemical step. So took intuition and judgment to ultimately go about doing that, but in inevitably you should ask yourself when you're doing modeling and solution, are the solvent molecules possibly playing a more important role than a general solvent, in which case maybe I should materialize them out of the continuum? Well, okay, we have finished a series of lectures on solvation. I thought I'd end with this rather lovely picture of uh, different phases, different condensed phases. So we've got some solid water and we've got some liquid water and it looks like maybe a humpback whale enjoying itself being solvated, a great free energy if you're a whale, I guess. Uh, and we will move on from here to the next topic in the course.